Today we're back in the AMC sample test. We're going to be going through the biology and biochemistry section, passage number nine. Let's go ahead and jump straight into this passage. Flow charting this passage out is going to read, the internal respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between tissue cells and capillaries. So we've got some basic sciences that are familiar to us, right? And as carbon dioxide is produced in the cells, it enters the capillaries, resulting in a blood partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So there's a relationship right off the bat. It says that CO2, which is made in the cells, is going to enter the capillaries, and that is going to give us this partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the blood of approximately 45 millimeters mercury. Now you can write that down, you can highlight that, whatever you want, um, but because it's a number, it's pretty easy to find. I usually just don't even do anything with them. In the capillaries, about 70% of the carbon dioxide transported by the blood is converted to bicarb um, by the following reaction that occurs within the red blood cells. Okay, so you notice that it tells us what happens to 70% of it, but it doesn't tell us what happens to the other 30%. And so they tell us about the 70%, and then they show us this reaction. So I'm imagining that they're going to ask us some form or fashion of a question about that reaction. Regardless, I am going to say... EQ1, or probably a better way for me to say what happens to 70% of this, is that 70% of this is converted to bicarb. So here looking at equation one, it looks like this is just talking about the bicarbonate equation, the buffer system. And this is something that's tested pretty frequent, frequently on the MCAT. It's usually used as an example rather than a standalone topic. So we'll note we're starting with CO2 and water. We're using carbonic anhydrase as the enzyme. We've got this carbonic acid intermediate and hydrogen ions and bicarb as the products. You do not have to memorize this reaction, but you should be familiar with it because it's tested or used as an example passage so frequently on the MCAT. It's always great to go ahead and learn it so you get a little bit of a head start. Reading on it says most of the bicarb ions leave the red blood cells and enter the plasma. All right, so they're going to leave the, the RBCs and enter the plasma. It says the resulting ionic imbalance in the red blood cells is equalized by rapid movement of chloride ions into the red blood cells from the plasma. So it looks like we've actually got the reverse flow of chloride ions. So chloride is going from the plasma to the red blood cells. Bicarb is going from the red blood cells to the plasma, and that charge gets equalized out because they both have a negative one charge. So that's what they're saying there. Another 23% of the um, CO2 is transported by the blood in the form of carbaminohemoglobin. And then it shows us here that all that means is that carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin. So now we know what's happening to another 23% of this bicarb. It is bound in the form of carbaminohemoglobin. Reading on, it says both CO2 and hydrogen ions bind reversibly, so that's important, right? They're binding reversibly to the globin part of the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cell. So that means that they're, even though they're going to bind, they can still leave. goes on to say the attachment of CO2 to form this carbaminohemoglobin also facilitates the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin at low PO2 levels. So I'm actually going to carry this out in the flow chart and say that this carbaminohemoglobin leads to the dissociation of hemoglobin O2 to hemoglobin plus O2 at low PO2 levels in the tissue capillary beds. The final 7% of the CO2 is produced by respiring cells dissolves directly into the plasma. That's actually high from the numbers I've read, but we'll go ahead and write down 7% is dissolved. So now we know what's going to happen to 100% of the CO2 that's in our cells. Last paragraph says, All forms of CO2 are transported from the tissues to the lungs, where they are returned to gaseous form and are exhaled during external respiration, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the capillaries and the alveoli of the lungs. So all this is really telling us here is that if you didn't know, we have this exchange between capillaries and alveoli of the lungs. Everything else is just kind of fluff there. So you've got a pretty involved flow chart. Um, let's see how we can use it and get all these answers correct. Number 48 says administration of a carbonic anhydrous inhibitor, which again is that enzyme that we talked about in equation one. If we use an inhibitor to that, what is that most likely going to cause an increase of? 
So I'm going to rephrase that as, what if I, what if I stop this? What if I stop this reaction from happening? What's going to end up accumulating? Is bicarb going to accumulate in the red blood cells? No, because we can't get to bicarb, right? So maybe not. Is carbonic acid going to accumulate? No, because we can't get to carbonic acid, so maybe not. C says carbon dioxide in the tissues. Well, it looks like we start with CO2. We cannot convert it, so maybe CO2 will accumulate. And then the question becomes, well, is CO2 in the tissues to begin with? Yeah, CO2 is in the tissues as a byproduct of respiration, right? So that kind of checks out. And then D says water in the tissues. So now we're kind of between CO2 in the tissues and water in the tissues. And I think there's a pretty good argument for either one of these answer choices to be correct. However, I'm going to end up going with carbon dioxide because water is so ubiquitous and there's so many means of controlling it. Carbonic anhydrase is not one of the main factors that controls water. Those are going to be functions of like the kidney, the renin aldosterone angiotensin system, things of that nature. So I'll say maybe not to water and CO2 is the correct answer. That's a tough one because that's where you have to pick the best answer, not the correct answer. 49 says, would the chloride concentration of the red blood cells be expected to be greater in systemic veins or in the systemic arteries? Okay, so they're asking about chloride concentration. Now, what do we know about chloride? What did our passage tell us? Our passage told us that chloride builds up in the plasma and then it gets exchanged with bicarbonate to the red blood cells. And so they're wanting to know where it's going to be the highest in the red blood cells. Well, if it's the highest in the red blood cells, that means that it has been exchanged at a higher rate because it originates in the plasma and gets exchanged to the red blood cells. That means we're also looking for the answer choice that has bicarbonate getting exchanged the most, which would put bicarb in the plasma. Okay, so there's a bunch of different things that we're looking for here, but we're really looking for which of these is going to have the highest exchange value. A says we would experience a lot of exchange in the veins because the bicarb concentration is higher in veins than in the arteries. Well, let's look at how bicarb is made. I mean, that's a true statement, but let's look at how bicarb is made first. Bicarb is made by combining CO2 with water. So that means that the more CO2 that you have, the more bicarb you're going to end up with. So you need to ask yourself, would you expect there to be more CO2 in arteries or veins? And because arteries, the entire job of them, one of the jobs of arteries is to carry oxygen to your tissues. And one of the jobs of veins is to carry CO2 back to your lungs to be blown off. You'd probably expect CO2 to be higher in value in the veins, right? So looking here, it says veins because the bicarb concentration is higher in veins than in arteries. Well, if the CO2 is higher in veins, then the bicarb is also going to be higher in veins, right? Because the Chalier's principle says that if we raise this side of the equation, it's going to drive the reaction to the right. So I like answer choice A for those reasons. It tells me that we... We know that we have a lot of CO2 in the veins. We know that that means that we would have a lot of bicarb in the veins. And if we have a lot of bicarb in the veins, then that's going to cause a large exchange of the chloride and throw it into the red blood cells. So that would actually answer this question perfectly. So we'll say maybe to A. B says veins because there are fewer red blood cells in veins than in arteries. That is not true. You don't lose red blood cells between the transfer of arteries and veins. You don't lose red blood cells in the capillaries or anything like that. So that's just a false fact. So maybe not B. C says arteries because the bicarb concentration is higher in arteries than in veins. We just talked about why that would not be the case because we have less CO2 in the arteries, which means that we would have less bicarb, right? Because the reaction would shift to the left. So maybe not C. As choice D says, arteries because there are fewer red blood cells. Okay, well, we just talked about why that was a dumb answer choice. You don't lose red blood cells between arteries and veins. So maybe not D, and the correct answer is A. Number 50 says, oxygen dissociates more readily from hemoglobin in an acidic environment. Okay, that's just a straight-up statement. This association will therefore occur most readily when the PCO2 is what? So it's saying that oxygen dissociates when it's acidic. This association occurs when C PCO2 is what? That's essentially asking, what do I need to do with PCO2 to have an acidic environment? 
Now, something that's worth committing to memory is that high concentrations of PCO2 leads to acidic environments. So if you were to hold your breath indefinitely, all that CO2 would build up and you would actually get an acidic environment inside of your blood. And you die, so don't do that. But if you don't know that, then let's just go ahead and look at this equation, see if we can use Le Chatelier's principle to figure it out. So if we have a high amount of CO2, then that's going to drive this reaction to the right, which would mean we would have an increase in hydrogen ions, which means a decrease in pH or acidity. So this dissociation will occur most rarely when the PCO2 is. So what PCO2 value will give us an acidic environment? It will be a high one, right? So we can rule out C and D. And then the question becomes, if we have a high CO2 value, is that going to drive the reaction to the left or to the right? Well, we just talked about using the Chatelier's principle. If we have a lot of CO2, it's going to drive the reaction to the right. So the correct answer here would be A. And then the last one says, lung capillaries are so narrow that red blood cells must pass through them in a single file line, hip and lip. This feature aids respiration how? So ask yourself, what are red blood cells doing in the lungs? What did the passage tell us they were doing? It tells us that they, that is the site of gas exchange. So these red blood cells are bringing CO2 to be blown off and they are absorbing oxygen to be taken to peripheral tissues. So how does being in a single file line help that? This one's pretty much just going to ask you to go through these answer choices and reason out which of these makes the most sense. A says increasing the production of CO2 in the red blood cells. The red blood cells aren't producing a ton of CO2. They're just carrying it. So maybe not A. B says allowing red blood cells to have direct contact with the alveoli. Well, if you remember here, they said there's an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the capillaries and the alveoli, not the red blood cells. So this is something... Um, that I'm kind of surprised they tested you on, but here I'll draw it out. So you have a red blood cell and that is within a capillary. You have a couple other layers like a basement membrane and, and a fluid layer, but then you have your alveoli. So gas is actually diffused through all of these layers rather than the red blood cells going into the alveoli and picking up gas. That's not how it works. They diffuse, th gas is diffused through these layers. So the red blood cell never actually touches the alveoli. The capillary touches the alveoli. So maybe not to be. C says giving maximum exposure of each red blood cell to diffusing gases. Well, that's, that's true. That's just saying we're gonna increase surface area because you can imagine if we, if this thing is surrounded by alveoli, you're gonna get more surface area touching that's going to lead to more gas exchange whereas if you had a giant capillary now the alveoli are only going to touch the red blood cells on one side that's a funky looking alveoli they're only going to touch it on one side and so that would decrease the surface area which means you would not get quite as much diffusion and that's a bad thing if we're talking about breathing and gas exchange so C would be correct because we're looking for something that's going to maximize exposure. So I like C. And then D says making hemoglobin available for carbon dioxide but not oxygen to bind. It doesn't make sense. Narrowing a lung capillary is not going to impact something as small as hemoglobin or either of these two molecules. So that was kind of a desperate step. So maybe not D. The correct answer is C. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.